Please welcome AMD's Corporate Vice President for Alliances, Roy Taylor. In my role as a Corporate Vice President of Alliances at AMD, I'm approached very often uh, by groups that want us to sponsor them and give them money to put together events and do different projects. And of course, we can't possibly support them all. But when one day I got a call telling me that I should talk to Cosmo, um, and I met him, I was uh, taken, uh, blown away by his enthusiasm and by his energy. And when I met the rest of the team, uh, I was even more impressed. And it's a thrill for me to be here, to, watch, to have watched what they've done with this event and how it's grown is it, really, really incredible. And uh, we absolutely intend to continue to support you guys and uh, one day have an event like this with 50,000 people. So, uh, so I'm thrilled. And AMD really, really believes in VR. I'm going to present you some facts and some figures and some numbers uh, during this presentation because as excited as we all are about VR, um, many of us in this room uh, need to go away and raise funding. And uh, I refer to the fact that only a sixth of those projects are funded so far. And even if you work in a corporation, uh, you need to go back to your boss, I know I do, and say, I believe that this project will work because. So in order to get these numbers together, I realized that no matter what numbers we come up with, we're going to be wrong. But I thought if we could share being wrong, then it wouldn't just be me by myself. So at the E3 event recently here in Los Angeles, we got together 74 of the great and the good of everybody around in the industry and had what we called the, the inaugural VR Council. So we have representatives from academia, from USC. Uh, we had Ted Chilutz from 20th Century Fox. Uh, we have representatives from Dell and HP, Lenovo, um, and we also had some uh, uh, studios. We had Reload Games were there, and we tackled what we figured were some of the, uh, the thorniest issues uh, for us to be able to go away and get projects funded and to take all of the things we want to do and, and make them real. So we came up with some conclusions, some things that we agreed upon. Um, the first is that VR is falling uh, today into two categories, what we call static VR, in interactive VR. And the two categories are worthy of support and investment in their own right, uh, but should be recognized as such. We also um, took a stab at the numbers, and these are the numbers that we, the 74 people of the council agree with. That by 2018, there'll be approximately 30 million um, VR headsets uh, in, in uh, Western Europe and North America. And they'll be made up of approximately 15 million uh, mobile, like Samsung Gear, uh, 10 million uh, console, of course that means uh, PlayStation, and 5 million PC. We also took a stab at uh, looking at how VR will uh, em emerge as in not just gaming. And it's clear to us there's going to be a number of categories, and I'm going to talk about those in a little bit more detail in a moment. But of those three uh, different kinds of headsets, we think that VR is going to need to be scalable. So when you're making the VR, it's going to be important for it to scale from a headset all the way up to a high resolution uh, PC configuration. But before we get to that, um, I want to remind everybody that uh, the road to success is going to be a little bit bumpy. Back in 1995, this is a famous quote from Bill Gates when he sent out a memo to, uh, to all of the employees in the company telling them that it was going to, the future was going to be the internet. And, and we know what's happened. In fact, the internet has, since its, uh, since its uh, foundation, added more than 3.4% to the world's GDP, um, trillions of dollars. And I believe that VR is going to do that. But it's important to realize that there's going to be probably some big changes. Uh, in the early days of the internet, the default search engine was not Google. I mean, many of you in here will be maybe too young to know that, but it was actually something called Alta Vista. And Alta Vista was going to be you know, the, uh, the big thing on the internet. It was sold for $2.4 billion, um, but then sadly it went away, and we know what happened with Google. That $2.4 billion was eventually sold for $140 million, and then finally closed in 2010. And then, of course, along came Google. Now, why am I mentioning this? Because along the way, VR is going to have an Alta Vista. Something's going to fail. It's going to seem like it's going to be the answer, and then it's not. But ultimately, the next Google is out there, um, probably in this room. It may, one of you guys, or a couple of you guys, may even be the next Larry and Sergey. So we shouldn't, and the reason for mentioning that is because AMD will make investment decisions, and we'll get some wrong. And some of you will make investment decisions, and you'll get those wrong too. 
but we shouldn't be discouraged because the next Google is out there. So now we're not going to be discouraged, so what next? So we took a stab, um, the council, at looking at what is the market that VR is going after? So we, we found some pretty interesting research. Uh, this shows the number of recreational hours per week that the average 26-year-old male has in North America. And it turns out that he has a discretionary 40 hours. And those 40 hours are broken down into 17 hours of TV. And that doesn't mean traditional television, by the way. Much of that is streaming onto a PC, a notebook, or tablet. He, the second uh, largest portion of his recreational time is 7.4 hours playing PC games and then a little less for console games. And it's interesting to note that he does both. And then this 26-year-old male also um, spends five hours on uh, mobile platforms and then three hours on his phone. That market, if you add that up in terms of what those are worth, is worth approximately $180 billion a year. So when you're going and doing your next presentation and saying, boss, uh, bank, uh, VR, um, VC, uh, what are we after? Well, we're trying to capture 40 hours a week in a $180 billion market. Now, the degree, however, to which that is going to happen and how fast that happens is going to be determined by uh, the quality and the content. Now, some of that is obvious, but I want to point something out to you. There is an online game, and uh, I don't have permission to mention which one, unfortunately, and it's uh, particularly popular. And the CEO told me that he has an end user that spent over a million dollars on in-game purchases in the game. Well, I guess my reaction was, well, that completely can't be true. Um, but it is true. And he also has several players that spent over $100,000. And so I asked the CEO, I grilled him because I, you know, I had it in my mind that one day I'd be in an environment like this presenting to a group like you and thinking, they're not going to believe me. And uh, so what he told me is, he said, look, Roy, you need to understand that to this particularly uh, rich person, his life in the game is more valuable to him than his own life. Now that was a, a heck of a realization because in creating VR, the better the quality that we make the VR, the more time people will spend in there and the bigger the investment they'll make. And so I think that the challenge for all of us in the room is not to try and make uh, VR that gets the largest possible audience and the largest common denominator. And this is an important point, because your bosses and your VCs will say to you, uh, how, how fast can you get this to millions and millions of people? How quickly can we sell millions and millions of copies? I think that's the wrong approach. I think the correct approach is to ask, how immersive can we make the VR so that people want to spend the money to get that experience and stay in it? And so we're going to need to think about making headsets uh, lightweight, and we're going to start to think about how do you create an experience where people want to stay in there, not for three minutes, such as we have currently, but for two to three hours. So that's the challenge that faces us. And uh, that's what uh, AMD is so interested in discovering with you and investing in. Now, along the way, some of those experiences are going to be silly. And some of us need to be prepared for the fact we're going to get challenged that it's a fad. It's uh, like stereo 3D. It'll come and it will go. We don't think so. But equally, nor do I believe that anybody's about to take a VR headset to the gym, nor do I think they're going to stand out in the middle of a street in Germany and, uh, and have passers-by watch them like this, or drive a tank. These are the kind of situations we, we, which we should be prepared to be teased about. But the reason that we believe in VR, and we think that VR is so special, is because after the silly comes the, becomes the awesome. AMD was immensely proud to partner with Zypra and Matter VR to produce a VR experience of the Wright Brothers' first flight, together also with Smithsonian. What was wonderful about this project was that as um, we supported it and went through it, I started to realize that I was learning all about the Wright Brothers. Now, as you can tell, I'm an Englishman, and I'm not steeped in American history particularly, and I didn't know much about the Wright Brothers. I didn't know, for example, that a 16-year-old boy just happened to be there when they, uh, when they did the first flight. And this uh, VR experience isn't about more than just isn't this cool we can look at the Wright brothers but it suddenly made uh, myself and the team at AMD realize that there's an opportunity for VR to change the way our children think about history and change the way they view education and if we can take children around the world today and get them interested in education and in history in a way they never were before that's something truly fantastic it's fantastic it, uh, it, 
for itself, but it's also fantastic in terms of you think about the market for schools and universities and add in VR headsets and experiences and hardware into all of them. So that was pretty cool and uh, made a big impression. The second project which we uh, were also proud to be involved in this year is uh, Neuro from Kite and Lightning from the wonderfully, incredibly talented uh, Corey Strasberger and Ikrima. And we sponsored this together with General Electric. And this project um, involved taking a house DJ and putting him through an MRI machine while he listened to his music and then tracking how his synapses behaved as he listened. And this was also not only a fun and incredibly a very cool um, experience, but suddenly made me also realize that there are fantastic opportunities for VR in science and medicine. And perhaps we'll find new ways to, uh, to learn about how the body and the brain works. And we'll be able to come up with uh, uh, cures for um, horrible diseases and find uh, new ways to learn about ourselves and, uh, and, and humanity. So that was really cool. And then recently, um, for the first time, I'd never done it before, I flew over San Francisco uh, like a bird, uh, together with a project called uh, Birdly. And this, this project is very, very cool. And in fact, actually, out here on the show floor, I also saw another flying VR uh, experience. And it made me realize that we're going to be able to map and explore territory. And we're also going to be able to go places we couldn't otherwise go. And probably unlikely to be able to ever fly over Everest or uh, explore the Amazon jungle. And so we're going to be able to teach children and ourselves to go and explore parts of the planet. And if that makes children want to put down their smartphone for a second and actually go and see them for real, well, that would be a pretty cool thing too. Now, none of this means that we're not also interested in games. And we were very pleased also to partner with Crytek uh, for their return to Dinosaur Island, where in this particular VR experience, you have to climb the mountain and disturb the dinosaurs. And the interaction of gameplay together with VR was, uh, was really, really terrific. And we'd like to encourage those of you that are in the gaming area to think more about uh, the, the interactive nature of the gameplay, especially about doing something more than just shoot them ups. The final um, big breakthrough for, uh, for me personally in terms of VR and realizing that this thing is not going to go away, it's not stereo 3D, was when I was told about Chris Milk's incredible TED talk where he showed that you could use VR um, in a way that I, it never, ever occurred to me, was um, over humanitarianism. And if you haven't seen his talk, I encourage you to do so, where um, Chris shows he took a VR camera to the uh, refugee camp in Syria, and he filmed the plight of the refugees. And then he used VR to show the politicians about just exactly what was really going on there. And I thought, goodness me, VR isn't just about fun and excitement and games and education and history and science, but we can use it for politics and humanitarianism, then I really, really knew that VR is not going to go away and actually it can be a, a force for, moral, for morality and doing right in the world, which is really terrific. So how do we make all of this happen? Well, we realized that as fantastic as the VR that is around today, that we need to get tools into the hands of uh, students so they can use VR to create and explore. And so AMD has uh, taken the step to start to support academia. And we're very proud to be working with uh, Dr. Anthony Borges at USC, um, Steve Lavelle at University of Illinois, and also with um, Besiktas University in Istanbul. If any of you have other schools or colleges, universities uh, that you believe were a good causes, uh, good projects for us to support, AMD will be pleased to do it. And the reason for this is because I don't know if any of you have thought about this, but here's how VR is created today. If you think about it, it's incredibly clumsy. We have to keep taking the headset off in order to create. That doesn't make any sense. It's almost agricultural. So we realize that what we're going to need to do is to create tools for VR in VR. And we're going to have to start thinking about how we use the space in front of our heads and divide it up into new ways. And so that's one of the reasons why uh, we want to involve and work with academia to try and solve those issues. And that leads me on to the next point to make, which is if you look at the tool chain that exists today, none of it actually was designed to support VR and none of it is actually perfect for VR. So AMD is talking to Autodesk and Adobe 
and to all of the other companies in the current tool chain to try to find ways where we can help them to create VR inside of VR. And that brings me back to my next point, which is uh, interactive versus static VR. Most of the VR we see today is camera caught. That has the advantage that the quality is very, very good. But to some degree, it doesn't seem natural to me personally that you can tease me with a world that's, that's rich and exciting and I can look at it from any angle, but then I can't interact. I can't reach out, I can't touch, I can't walk. And so we're going to need to meld the two worlds of static camera called VR together with traditional game engines, which I am uh, now calling film engines. And so we're working with companies like Crytek, who have a product called Cinebox, to take a traditional game engine and make it suitable for entertainment and VR. And I'm also pleased to tell you we're working with Epic and we're working with Unity to do the same thing too. This is a new world. This hasn't been done before. Using a game engine to, you, to create VR and to make the VR interactive is going to come up with some fresh and new challenges. If anybody in this room thinks they know how to solve some of those issues, AMD would love to talk to you. And we're not doing uh, just investing in projects, we're also inventing. And so I'd like to ring a uh, bell for ourselves a little bit, if you'll allow me. A little while ago, uh, AMD invented something called Mantle. This is a, an application programming interface uh, for graphics processors. And it allowed uh, programmers to get nearer to the metal. That's an expression which means just get out of all the bloat that's in the way uh, when you're creating. That experience and that expertise then led us to uh, invent something called Liquid VR. I'm not going to go into it too much today, um, but we will be announcing future versions of Liquid VR. And if anybody is interested in knowing how you can use Liquid VR to increase the frame rates and reduce the latencies, which is the enemy of all of us in this room for VR, uh, then come to me and let me know. And the reason that uh, we're so interested in all of this, by the way, we do have a selfish agenda. I'm happy to state it publicly. VR needs GPUs. We are in what I call a race to the top and a race to the bottom. When CV1 comes out in Q1 next year, the target uh, for that for us is 90 frames a second at 2K per eye resolution at around 10 milliseconds or, or slightly less of latency, which requires around 8 teraflops of performance. We believe the target that we need to get to for all of you and for all of us is 16K per eye at around 144 frames a second um, with zero latency. And we believe that that will be possible, but it will require around about a petaflop of performance. And that's what led to um, the, uh, the tweet you see here uh, from somebody involved in the industry, which says that the good news is for all of us in the, uh, in the GPU world and in the content creation world is we have wonderful job security for quite some time to go. So good news. But once we've got to that point, there'll be a diminishing return on investment to continue. You can't get better than zero latency. And we probably don't need much more than 16K per eye. Once we've reached that point, then the next goal is to reduce it and shrink it until we can get down into a pair of glasses. And hopefully that will happen before I die. So we talked a little bit about the software. Let me talk a little bit about the hardware. Um, AMD recently invented something called HBM, or high bandwidth memory. We took the memory chips that are on a, usually on a graphics card, and we used an interposer uh, to put them directly onto the GPU. And that allowed us to do a couple of incredibly cool things. The first is to give you a very, very fast connection between the GPU and the memory and a very wide bus width of 4096 bits. This was an ambitious program, but yet we executed on it and we're shipping. And this invention not only will give us tremendous performance, but very importantly, in very small form factors. And when I look around the show floor here and look at the PCs that are being used, it's clear to me that we need to give you very, very powerful, high-performance machines to run the highest quality VR in the smallest form factors. That led us to invent something called Quantum. Quantum is an AMD-designed small PC box which, is gonna have, uh, which has a dual Fury GPU, our latest and fastest. It's designed for liquid VR and for projects uh, on application we are going to start to supply these to you. And so for the next VR event, it's uh, my ambition to see that every single demo here is running on a Quantum. But that's an AMD design box. As I travel around Hollywood, the other thing I see is that the Falcon Northwest Tiki is incredibly popular. So I'm pleased to announce here today that we are working with the CEO of Falcon Northwest, Kelt Reeves, to put not a single 
Fury high-end GPU, but a dual GPU um, configuration into the, the Falcon Northwest Tiki. That will give you a Tiki box, which I know is so popular, all of you, that will deliver around 16 teraflops performance. That's roughly double where we are today. So in conclusion, I thought it'd be fun to show this photograph, uh, which shows the original, well, one of the original uh, <laughs> inventors from 1963. You see they were thinking about VR even back in 1963. And my task to you, my challenge to all of you, my message to all of you is, if we're going to make VR delightful, we're going to make VR which makes us want to do everything we can to show it to our friends and to, and to immerse ourselves in it at home, we have to do more than just create something which is okay. We have to do something which blows people's minds, which makes them determined to do whatever they can to get into VR. And AMD is here for you, and we want to help you, and we want to join you. And so uh, let's have a great show, and if any of you want to learn more about how AMD can help you, um, please come and say hello after, after these sessions. Thank you, everybody. Thanks for your attention.